We're on the battlefield for Jesus. Come and join us in the fight. We're marching against Satan, and we're standing for what's right. We won't desert nor surrender. We are soldiers till we die. We're on the battlefield for Jesus. Victory is our battle cry. We're on the battlefield for Jesus. Come and join our happy throng. We're blood-washed, born-again believers, and we sing a joyful song. King Jesus is our mighty captain, and it's him we shall obey. We're on the battlefield for Jesus, winning souls for Christ today. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is due him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. We're on the battlefield for Jesus. Come and join us in the fight. Though the enemy be all around us, we shall not be put to flight. By faith we know we have the victory, and no matter what the cost, we will fight to rescue hopeless sinners. Not a soul must ever be lost. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is due him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. Baptist Church, so good to be in the house of the Lord this morning for our morning service. Glad to have each and every one of you on this last day of June, last Sunday in June. So go ahead and stand with me. 415 will be our opening hymn. 415, leaning on the everlasting arms as we open in song. 415, leaning on the everlasting arms. I hope today you can say that for yourself, that you're leaning on the everlasting arms. 415, as we open in song. What a fellowship, what a joy divine, leaning on the everlasting arms. What a blessed is, what a peace is mine, leaning on the everlasting
Please remain standing as we go to God in prayer this morning. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just want to say thank you. And Lord, we know that your arms are everlasting, God. We don't have to rely on worldly wisdom. We don't have to worry about lived experiences, God. I pray that we just trust wholly, Lord, in you. And so, God, as we are here this morning, I pray that we would just focus in on your word as is preached by Brother Brown. I pray, God, that we would look to, to see what you have for us, Lord, and that each of us walk out with something that we know that you spoke to us about, oh God. So I pray that our hearts will be prepared throughout the singing, oh God, and that we would just remove anything that distracts us from your word. So we're thankful unto you, God, for your everlasting arms, your everlasting word, Lord, your promises that are always true. We're thankful to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. 145 is our next song. 145, burdens are lifted at Calvary. 145, if you took your burden to Calvary and left it there, this is your song. 145, burdens are lifted in Calvary, at Calvary. 145. are lifted at Calvary. As we get ready to take up our morning offering and announcements, we first want to take some time to recognize if there are any visitors this morning, our first time visitors to Cornerstone Baptist Church. We don't want to ask you to say or do anything, but we do want to get a record of your visit with us. And at this time, we want to ask if you want to raise your hand, our ushers will fail through. We want to give you a card with a pen. That card, we just ask that you fill out the side with the information, and then you tear it in half and say with the picture of our pastor and the information, you keep that side, and when the offering comes true, you put the side with the information on it in the offering plate so we could have a record of your visit. And then the pen is a gift from us to you to say thank you for worshiping with us this morning. And our 
announcements now are pretty standard, but uh, we have an evening service at 5 p.m. So please do come out for our evening service tonight. It's going to be a different message with a different emphasis. So please do come out and see what the Lord has for you tonight at 5 p.m. After our evening service, we'll have our normal men's accountability meeting right after in the normal place. So men, the accountability meeting. And at Wednesdays, we do have our Bible study and prayer time at 7 p.m. here at the church. So please do come out to our prayer meetings. We do uh, want to have folks come out and just pray with us and study God's word. Of course, our Saturday soul winning and men's and women's soul winning at 9 o'clock and our bus and soul winning visitation at 9.30. So at this time, we ask that you... You silence our cell phones so when the time for God's word to be preached, there's no distractions at that time. So please do take them out, check, make sure that they're off, their volume is down, the batteries are out, you hide it on a rock, whatever you need to do to make sure they're not distracted. They're not a distraction, sorry. Uh, on July 7th, we are going to have Bible Day here at Cornerstone Baptist Church with Brother Dave Barker. Uh, they call him the walking Bible, and if you come, you will see why. Uh, he'll be with us. It's always a good time when Brother Barker is here um, at the church, so that's July 7th, Bible Day. Our VBS is fastly approaching. Those dates are the 15th through the 19th of Vacation Bible School here at the church. They'll be Monday through Friday from 6 to 8, so please do sign up for those who want to help with VBS. But before we get to VBS, we have to have our VBS work party and that is July 14th, uh, midday. Um, so we will have a work party the Sunday before VBS. Then after VBS, we will be all attention focused on our August stewardship month. And we take the month of August and we have a stewardship emphasis here at Cornerstone Baptist Church. And we focus a lot of time and energy around the topic of stewardship. And that culminates at the end of the month with a stewardship banquet on August 25th. So please do start to pray about that. And we will, of course, tell you more as that time approaches. September 1st, Christian Education Sunday. We will be preaching for the need for Christian education for our youth. And we will definitely be uh, uh, having a guest preacher for that day to talk all about Christian education as we plan to begin year number four for Cornerstone Baptist Academy here at the church. So please also be in prayer for Christian Education Sunday, September 1st. So at this time, I'll ask our ushers if they could make their way forward. And as they make their way forward, I'll ask if, uh, JC if you could come and bless the offering at this time. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this morning. And God, we just thank you, Lord, for this, this song that we just sung, God knowing that our burdens are lifted at Calvary. And God, if many of us are here this morning, God, with heavy hearts, burden, different things, God, bills and sickness and death. But God, as, as we saw, oh Lord, we can have all those things, Lord, lifted off our shoulder. If we get those things, God, to you, Lord, you know what to do with those things. And Father, we just thank you, Lord, for your promise of how you continue, Lord, to hold us in your arm, God, as a father does a child. And God, I just pray that we will love you as such. And so, Lord, we just thank you, God, for our, our church and just the wonderful things you're doing here, God, in our church. Pray also that you'll be with pastors. He's way, God, you give him the spirit to preach. And, Lord, just be with uh, Brother Brown, God, as he steps up this morning, God, to deliver a message, Lord, to us. I just pray to God that we, we will receive it. And, God, just thank you, Lord, for your safety, God, your love, and we just thank you, Lord, for your son. And God, we always want to pray, God, for if anyone in our midst is not born again, that they don't know Jesus Christ can lift their burdens, Lord, and I just pray that they will know it today, that Jesus Christ does still save. So, Father, we just thank you, Lord, for your word, and we just thank you, Lord, for your church, and we thank you, Lord, for our salvation, and we ask that you will bless. And to help this offering, God, thank you, Lord, for being able to give, and we ask that in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.
Go ahead and stand with me one last time this morning. 448 will be our next song, My Savior's Love. 448, My Savior's Love. Let's sing about the glorious love this morning. 
Thank you. Maybe seated. speaker this morning is definitely no stranger to Cornerstone. Definitely a, a joy to always have Brother Michael Brown preach. Hearing so much air for uh, Brother Brown, I'm like, huh, thought I already preached, but it's other Brown. So as he comes, let's pray for him as God, give, as God has given him something to give to us. So Brother Brown, you come and you deliver what God has given to you. Thank you, Brother. Brother Brown, thank you, Brother Brown. Yes, Brother Brown. All right, good morning, everyone. Well, welcome to this morning service here at Cornerstone Baptist Church. If you will, please stand with me. I'm turning your Bible to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1. In 
Genesis chapter 1. We're going to start reading at verse 27. The Bible says, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I just pray that you will be with me. Lord, help me, Lord, to preach what you want me to preach, God. And Lord, I just pray, Lord, that you will continue to speak to me, Lord, as I preach, God. I pray, Lord, that you be down here with us, Lord, in the spirit, Lord. Be with our hearts, Lord. Help us, Lord, to have a, a mind to listen, God, and to, to pay attention, God. I pray, Lord, that you will minimize distractions this morning. Lord, I just pray for your hand and your power in the service. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. The title of my sermon today is, There is a Difference. There is a difference. I have two points today, and it's on purpose because I would like to emphasize the number two for this reason. You will find out when you find these two points, when you hear these two points. Number one, the role of a man. Number two, the role of a woman. The reason that I'm emphasizing two is because in the beginning, God made two genders. Male and female. Man and one man. If you were here last week or if you um, listened to the sermon that Pastor preached last week, then you know that Facebook has well over two genders that you can choose from when creating a Facebook account, I believe, or even changing it after you done created your Facebook account. But here in the Bible, we see only two genders, and that's man and one man. Point number one, the role of a man. The role of a man. First up on my list I have, a man is to work. A man is to work. We can see that here in Genesis, when God created Adam, he did what? Put him in the garden to work. If you turn into Genesis chapter 2, Genesis chapter 2, the next chapter over, verse number 15 of Genesis chapter 2, the Bible says, And the Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. In the beginning, work was present. In the beginning, work was given to man. Work is good. Work is good before the fall of man, even though after the fall, he did tell us that we would have to work even more. Right? So here we see that the role of a man, one of the roles of a man is to work. We also see this commandment to work in the New Testament. So if you will, turn to me, with me to 2 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians, chapter 3. Well, we see, yet again, this commandment to work. Second Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse number 10. The Bible says, For even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. Here in the old, here in the New Testament, where the, the new church, the New Testament church, here it's plain and simple. The commandment was if you don't work, you should not eat. A lot of men today have this mentality that they want to eat, but they don't want to work so that they can eat. And with that mentality, it leads them to take another route to eat outside of the will of God. They turn to things such as scamming, robbing, lying, cheating. The sin of not working can lead to a boatload of other sins. The Bible is clear that men ought to work. Next, 
Men are to be strong and brave. Turn to your Bibles back to the Old Testament to Joshua chapter 1. Joshua chapter 1. We're going to read verse number 9 of Joshua chapter 1. Men are to be strong and brave. Here the Lord is speaking to Joshua. Joshua chapter 1 verse 9 it says, Have not I commanded thee? Be strong and of a good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed. For the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. Now here the Lord is speaking to Joshua. and He is telling him to step up in leading Israel after Moses' death. Yes, he is talking to Joshua about the mission of leading Israel. But men, what is it that we can take from this? We have a Jerusalem that we must lead as well. We must not be afraid for our Jerusalem. Instead, we must be strong and of a good courage for our Jerusalem. 1 Corinthians chapter 16 in the New Testament. 1 Corinthians chapter 16. I'm going to read verse 13. First Corinthians chapter 16, verse 13. The Bible says, Watch ye, stand fast in the faith. Quit you like men, be strong. Quit you like men, be strong. That phrase, quit you, means be brave. So, be brave like men, be strong. I believe, I believe the Bible is telling us that men ought to be strong and to be brave. Um... Not too long ago, uh, probably like a few months ago, I would want to say, there was a lady that was walking through this alley back here. And as she was walking through the alley, um, not too far behind her, there was a, a male following her. And it was real uh, suspicious. And as she walked down the alley, he just walked down the alley like a little bit behind her, not trying to be too close up on her or whatnot. And she came along here, and he peeked around the corner, and then came along around there as well. And a couple of men from our church saw this. And when they saw this, they didn't turn their head and say, well, it's not my problem. They didn't turn their head and say, well, that's not my sister, that's not my mother. There's no one that I know. Instead, they took action. And what did they do? As she kept walking down here on... Um, 62nd Street here, they hopped in a, a vehicle and they went around to meet the young lady to find out if she was okay. Here in Chicago, we got some, some, some crazy folks out here that would do some crazy things for crazy reasons. And to me, I would say that is a great form of bravery for those men to go out out of their way and possibly putting themselves in danger to help a stranger. I believe we ought to be brave, men. Brother Jericho, he's a walking bravery guy there. You know what I'm saying? He had a gun pointed to him. He says, shoot me. That's, that's a different type of bravery, but he, it was a bravery to say the least, right? Men ought to be brave and to be strong. Um, simply put. Next, men are to love. Yes, we are to be strong. Yes, we are to be brave. But we also must love. Turning to Matthew chapter 22. Matthew chapter 22. I'm going to read verse 37 through 39 of Matthew chapter 22. Men are to love. Matthew chapter 22, verse 37 through 39, it says, 
Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Here Jesus is telling us that we have to love. Love who? Well, first and foremost, we must love him. We must love him plainly because of who he is. He deserves our love, every bit of it. And how do we do that? Let's read the second part of that verse of 37. Actually, we're going to start with a red letter and starts there. It says, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God. That's the commandment. Love the Lord thy God. How? With all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might. The Bible don't say give him half your heart or half your soul or half your mind. He wants it all and he deserves it all even more than we can give. Next, we should love our neighbors. Look at verse 39. It tells us that. And the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor. Thou shalt love thy neighbor. That is a commandment. We should love our neighbor. And how do we love our neighbors? Let's finish the verse. As thyself. Mm. That's a hard one. That's a hard one. At times, that can be extremely hard. But it doesn't matter what I feel about how hard it is or what you feel about how hard it is. It is a commandment, and we must strive to do it. Amen. Let's not be too strong or too brave to show some love towards one another, for it is needed. Next, a man is to, uh, next, a man, men are to be, if married, a husband. A husband. Turn to Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2, verse 24. As some of you may know, if not, and that's, that's probably good too. Um, Today they're having the uh, sodomite, I mean the, the pride parade. And um, it's going against this, 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 this union that God has put together of a husband and a wife. And the government is officiating it and everybody's just going along with it. It's just it's so wicked, honestly. And sometimes I just... I'm ashamed of of my city when they do things like that. But we got to pray for them. We got to pray for them. Genesis chapter 2, verse 24. The Bible says, Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. We all know that the other part in a marriage to a wife is a husband. Even the world knows that. What upsets me is that they take it and they use it in the wrong way. The way that God never meant for it to be used. Today, a woman can marry another woman and they both will be considered wives. Or a man can marry another man and they both can identify as husbands. Or even one of them can feel more dominant than the other and then grab a hold of that masculine title of a husband. Now, as I was preparing this, I sort of kind of didn't even want to use the word Mary because technically they're not married in the eyes of God. Just because the government officials let you sign a piece of paper and they sign it after you doesn't make you married. God ordains it, and he's not going to ordain no uh, homosexual marriage. It's sickening, just thinking about it, honestly. I had a close friend who fell into this sinful lifestyle of homosexuality. And it breaks my heart to think about it. You know, sometimes I think, like, was there something that I could have done to help prevent it? But now, it's not necessarily too late. I just got to continue to pray for him 
fast for them and just pray that God would give them a, 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 a yearning to get back to him. Let's pray for a true repentance for them before it is too late. So we got men are to work. Men are to be strong and brave. Men are to love. Men are to be a husband. And five, men are to be responsible. Genesis chapter 3 should be in Genesis already here. Genesis chapter 3. We're going to read verse 9 through 12 of Genesis chapter 3. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, Who told thee that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree, whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? And the man said, The woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. Here God came to the man, the head of the house, when he had a problem with the house. He already knew what had happened. So he came to the one who is supposed to take responsibility for what had happened. We see later in verse 12 that he did not. Instead, instead of Adam owning up to the mistake of his household, he started the blame game. Men, we are to own up to our responsibilities. Whether good or bad, we need to acknowledge it and handle it when necessary. When the family devotions don't get done, it's our fault. And you have to know and understand that. Men, when we don't guard our eyes, it's our fault. No one else's. Now, the immodest stuff does play a role. We might not meant that first look, but the double take and anything after that is sin. We have to acknowledge that and handle it as such. Let's look back at verse 12 here. Who is Adam really blaming here? He's blaming God, right? He said, the woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I did eat. If he wasn't blaming God, he would have just said, the woman gave me of the tree and I did eat. But no, he had to put God in the equation. He said, because this woman that you gave me, I did sin. He is blaming God for his sin. That is not a responsible or wise answer. We must take responsibility and not try to push it off to something or someone else. So we got men are to work. Men are to be strong and brave. Men are to love. Men are to be a husband. And men are to be responsible. Now the Bible speaks on other roles that a man has, but Today, I only list five for you today. And we're going to move on to my second point. The roles of a woman. The roles of a woman. Let's turn back to Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2. We're going to read verse 18 of Genesis chapter 2. Women are to be helpers. Genesis chapter 2, verse 18. The Bible says, and the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a help meet for him. The creation of Eve we see here is twofold. She was made so that the man wouldn't be alone. Amen. And she was made to help her husband. So women, God gave you to your husband or will give you to your husband to help him with the work God has given him to do. Don't hinder his work with bad attitudes or nagging all the time. How can he get things done if he has to fight with the world then comes home and fight with his wife? Instead of being, instead, be a helper and come alongside of him and encourage him and keep him doing good. Proverbs chapter 21. If you turn that with me real fast here, Proverbs chapter 21. Proverbs chapter 21, we're going to read verse number 19. 
Proverbs 21, verse 19, it says, It is better to dwell in the wilderness than with a contentious and angry woman. Women, your attitude can and will affect those around you. Rather is good or bad. And no one wants to be around an angry woman. The Bible tells us that. That's what the Bible says. I'm just, I'm just saying what the, what the Bible says. Number two, women are to be teachers. Turn to Titus. Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2. Verses 3 and 4 of Titus chapter 2. The Bible says, The aged women likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children. Here we see women are to teach. Who should they be teaching? Verse number four. In the beginning it says that they may teach the young women. So yes, women are to teach. They should teach the young women. And what are they supposed to be teaching? To be sober, which is to be alert, to be serious, to be single-minded, to love their husbands, to love their children. If the job of teaching these things is assigned to the older women, then it only makes sense that the older women understand these things themselves. How can one teach something that don't know it for themselves? There are some benefits of women having extra education under their belt, like being able to work at a Christian school or being able to homeschool even your children. But they must be careful on who they teach and the way that they teach. First Timothy, a couple books back here, the Bible tells us about a little bit of a restriction on who the women can teach. First Timothy chapter two, verse 12. First Timothy chapter two, verse 12, it says, the Bible says, but I suffer not a woman to teach nor to usurp authority over the men, but to be in silence. Here the Bible is telling us that women should not have certain authority over a man. This is yet another way the world tries to corrupt what God has put in place. Women are taking positions that put too much authority over men. It happens in jobs, it happens in sports, it happens in government, and it even happens in churches. Don't get me wrong, I don't have a problem with a woman, with women leadership. The problem comes with who they are leading. <laughs> Number three, women are to be modest, modest. Still here in 1 Timothy chapter 2, we're going to look at verse number 9. The Bible says, In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broided hair or gold or pearls or costly array. The female has a divinely implanted desire to have a good appearance. That's why she may take an hour we're getting ready to leave the house, while us men only take about 10 to 15 minutes, if that. There is nothing with wanting to look good. The Bible warns about extravagant and loud dressing. Women are not to dress immodestly so as to exploit their feminine charms, which hinders their brethren from worship and tempt them to sin. Neither should women overdo their dress, provoking their sisters in Christ to jealousy. When I was just a little boy, before I started coming here to Cornerstone, we went to a, another church not too far from where we were staying, and 
It was one of those rock concert, Holy Ghost catching type of churches. Right, mama? <laughs> and we went to that church on Sundays, and, and I listened to this music, the, the drums banging in the back, and praise dances, all that stuff now that I see is uh, not in this, in this book here. Other than the, the, the music and the, uh, the, the Holy Spirit catching things, I did remember the way some of the women would dress. They would dress with um, all this type of makeup on and the highest of heels, got them seven feet tall. And it seemed like every week it was a contest on who can have the biggest, shiniest, expensivest hat and they wear it in the service. And don't sit behind them, because you ain't gonna see a thing. Now the dresses, to, to my knowledge, the dress themselves was, was pretty, pretty modest, to, to my knowledge. But I have been also to multiple funerals, family, friends, and everyone I went to, there was someone there that showed up looking like they was going to a club afterwards. Here, Paul is speaking against both of these sinful ways of dress. The way of, of enticing others and also the way of, of extravagant, bold dressing. Number four, women should be virtuous, virtuous. Proverbs chapter 31, Proverbs. Chapter 31, verse 10, if you could turn there with me real fast. Proverbs 31, verse 10. The Bible says, who can find a virtuous woman for her price is far above rubies. Here we see that a virtuous woman is good and costly. It would be considered a rarity to find. Um, rubies are very precious stones and they are expensive. Here the Bible compares the virtuous woman above the very precious stones of rubies. And what is it that this virtuous woman do? She cares for her family. Verse number 15 of chapter 31, it says, she riseth also while it is yet night and giveth meat to her household and a portion to her maidens. So she cares for her house. Next, she helps the needy. She helps the needy. Verse 20, it says, she stretcheth out her hand to the poor. Yea, she reacheth forth her hand to the needy. What else does she do? She speaks wisdom. Verse 26, she opened her mouth with wisdom, and her tongue is the law of kindness. Today's women are becoming quite the opposite. They want the government or the father or the man of the house to do the things in the home that they should be taken care of, such as cooking or cleaning or just keeping the home while they run out to do whatever. She finds every way possible to not be able to help the needy. She goes out her way to avoid those who are poor and if you were to take the average woman of today in this world, the average woman of the world today, and do the complete opposite of what they're doing, you'll be much more in line with the Bible than they was at the time that you did what you did. A virtuous woman, a virtuous woman. Women should be looking for these things, being able to get these opportunities to help the needy, 
looking for the opportunity to provide for the house, to, to help the house, to, to serve her husband or, or to serve the church for those who may not be married. So we got the four points for the woman role. The women are to be helpers. The women are to be teachers. Women are to be modest, and women should be virtuous. In conclusion, the Bible shows us only two genders. and only gives us roles for two genders. So if anyone was to claim any of them other genders, then not only is they making up a different gender, but they're making up different roles as well. So they're making up what they are supposed to do as they go along. There's nothing set in stone, so how we know what's right and wrong. We know what's right and wrong because what the Bible tells us. It's two genders, so it doesn't matter how you feel, no matter how I feel, no matter how no one else feels about that subject because it's already been established a long time ago. What's going on out there in that parade today? It's a group of people used of Satan to do what he loves to try to do, and that's to corrupt every righteous thing that God has for us. Now I'm done, I'm done, but I have one last illustration. I was on my phone and I saw a video. They was having um, like a, a sit down conversation about uh, homosexuality. And inside of this little small group, there was a, a woman and another uh, manly looking woman. And uh, the, the woman looking woman had said this thing here, that she was, and I quote, a gay Christian with her wife, husband beside her. And then the, the group was trying to uh, help her understand that that's not possible. They tried to use what we all should be using when it comes to that, and that's this book. And you know what she said? She said that you cannot use scripture to condemn what we have going on. And I'm just trying to fathom, like, what is it that you're going off of? Because of that, she said, we can't use scripture to, to condemn them because then we'll be holding scripture or this Bible above their personal relationship with God. According to this book, the only way to have a personal relationship with God is through it. So how is it that we can't use scripture to condemn the, the homosexual marriage pride movement? Revelations, last, last, last scripture here I'm going to use today. Revelations chapter 21. Revelations chapter 21. Verse number eight. If she continued to live her life as a quote unquote gay Christian, then there's a place that uh, she's gonna find out about here. Unless she's repenting. Verse number eight, it says, but the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and the murderers and the whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burn it with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. I hope that one day she can accept the Bible as what she's supposed to live by and that she can get on the right track because it's not God's will for any to perish. He wants all to come to repentance and to come to him and accept him as their Lord and their personal Savior. Yes, In fact, today, it's not necessarily a salvation message, but if you're not saved, then there is a place that, unfortunately, you will go if you don't settle that. And it's called hell, the lake of fire that burneth with brimstone. It is the second death. You will die on this earth, and then you will die again. But the second death is going to be worse than the first. Because it's going to be 
a continual death. So I urge you today, please, come talk to one of us. If you don't know that you're saved, if you don't know that you're going to heaven when you die, we want you to know that today. God wants you to know that today. Please, don't leave today not knowing for sure, 100% sure, that when you die, that you will go to heaven. Because when we walk out that door, there's no telling what, what's going to come to us. The Bible tells us that our life is like a vapor. Appear for a little time and then vanish. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I, I thank you, God, for Lord, your word, Lord, this book, Lord, and, and all of its truths. I pray, God, that, that you will speak to hearts, Lord, through it. Lord, I pray, Lord, that you will help me, Lord, to, to better myself, Lord, as a man. Lord, knowing these roles, Lord, and Lord, we can know them, Lord, and, and not do anything about it. Lord, I just pray, Lord, that some decisions can be made today. Lord, I pray, Lord, that your spirit will be working in someone's heart, God, to, to accept you as their Lord and personal Savior, God. Lord, let them know today is the day, Father. Tomorrow is not promised, God. The next hour is not promised. The next minute is not promised, God. There's been men, Lord, that has been speaking one minute and, and dropped dead the next. Lord, I just pray, Lord, for a speedy decision-making, Lord, on the behalf of the lost souls, God. We thank you for today. Pray that you bless it, continue to bless it, and give us safety as we depart. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You can stand with your heads bowed and eyes closed. The Lord spoke to your heart today. The altar is open. Thank you for viewing our live stream service today. We want to let you know that our service.